afternoon, everybody. Nice to see such a, a big audience. <laughs> um, my name is Joel McCormick, and I'm presenting this, giving this presentation on behalf of representing the research done by two colleagues and myself. One of them is uh, Parvane Tavakoli, who works in the Department of English Language and Applied Linguistics. Um, she has been working in the area of uh, multilingualism for a number of years and has published a number of articles in the area of fluency. And the other person is Colin Campbell, who works with myself in the International Study and Language Institute. We have been teaching on pre-sessional courses in relation to this particular research project. We were teaching um, spoken language. And our colleague, Parvane, um, was interested in doing research in the classroom. So she approached us to see if we would collaborate with her over one term period and conduct this research. We were particularly interested in the whole area of fluency because it's one of the areas that students often say that they would most like to improve. And they talk about improving the speech rate, um, their use of vocabulary so they don't have to think so much when they're trying to say something. And very often, some of them, the um, students from Japan or China were quite envious of the Middle Eastern students we had who were so able to speak at length about any topic at all and they often said that they would like to be like them. From my own point of view, I hadn't really thought about specifically teaching um, strategies to improve um, fluency practice. Fluency, I had envisaged as something that would develop along with the student's general ability and the more time, especially if they were living in um, the target language country, that they would likely to improve over time, gradually, and it wasn't something that I thought you could actually teach specifically. Um, also, it was an area that was part of our oral proficiency criteria, <coughs> and sometimes we had quite a few discussions about where the students were too highly rated or too lowly rated, based on their fluency. Fluency can give the impression of somebody being quite competent in the language, and we felt this was worth exploring in terms of our criteria as well. So uh, Parvane Tavakoli was basically our mentor. She pointed us in the direction of some of the literature that we should look at, and we set off on this journey. Some of the key words that came up in the beginning were things like, which won't surprise you, fast, fluid, smooth, smooth, hesitation, free, automatic, and efficient processing of the language. These were all key words that were involved when we talked about fluency. <clears throat> so Galowitz um, put it very succinctly when he talked about speech, flu speech fluency, including fast speech and the relative absence of undue hesitations, pausing, repetition, and repairs. This might seem like quite um, a simple definition, but previous research that he had conducted into language learners in terms of what fluency meant in what they were engaging in, revealed something much more complex. So here the key words are the students are basically they're planning and assembling an utterance. In other words, they've got the cognitive processes that are going on before they ever say anything. They're trying to draw on the grammar and the vocabulary that they have. And at the same time, it's limited by <coughs> time when they want to communicate a message. So they've got to try and get that across efficiently while the person they're talking to is still listening. So it's quite a complex area when you think about it all in that kind of way. So Galowitz divided it further in terms of looking at three different concepts. He suggested that cognitive fluency is one area, in other words, that planning and thinking and what goes on, but we actually don't see the underlying process before the student produces or the learner produces speech. Then the actual utterance, which is what the listener hears when the communication act is taking place. And the perceived fluency, and this relates to what I mentioned earlier about the assessment of students. Sometimes a student can seem very fluent, um, and actually they might be doing a lot of repetition, or they might have a very limited vocabulary, so they might be less fluent than a student who, by their very nature, 
thinks a little bit more carefully before they say something in order to phrase something um, in the way that they really want to do it. We looked at Sigalovitz's work and also that of Skian, Peter Skian, who had looked in more detail at utterance fluency, and this was the area that we decided to focus on for our particular study. He had considered this in three different areas, breakdown fluency, speed fluency, and repair fluency. And I think they're fairly self-explanatory there. Breakdown being, meaning silence or pauses in different area ways. Speed fluency, how, how fast the speech is. And repair fluency, how many interruptions. And these interruptions could be the student correcting themselves or repeating something several times in order to get started. So it was building on the work that he had done along with um, my colleague, Parvane Tavioli again, Tavacoli. Um, they looked at, in more detail, they looked at the whole idea of silence and what actually, how it manifested itself. So we're talking, this handout will be available, by the way, on the website. If, um, the silence was the number of unfilled pauses, and we were looking particularly at whether the pauses occur in the middle of a clause or at the end of a clause. <coughs> they also looked at the mean length of pauses. Um, and if a pause was significant, it was considered to be 0.4 of a second or longer. The proportion of time that was spoken and the total amount of silence within that time it was spoken. So that all fitted into the category of silence fluency. The second area they looked at was repair fluency. And we considered two of these aspects when we were analysing the data that we received from students. One of those was the number of false starts, and the other one was the number of repetitions. And the third area they looked at was speed fluency, which we also considered as um, part of our analysis. And that was basically the mean length of run, um, the number of syllables that there were between two pauses, and also the number of um, syllables per minute. This is all um, done in a much more technical way. My colleague, um, Tavioli, Parvani Tavioli, is an expert on running all of these analyses. Um, and if you do want more details of that breakdown, um, she's quite happy for you to, to um, email her about that. <coughs> So, when we were looking into how we would design our own um, research project, we looked at what already had been done in the field. And one of these areas was that of um, task design and the impact that this has on fluency. I'm sure that's something you're all familiar with. Um, you've got things like research that's been done into giving students planning time, means that the work that they produce is more fluent. Also, if you structure things in a way that's familiar with them, if it's the kind of task that they've done before, these can all <coughs> have an impact on fluency. And there has been uh, research, a lot of research done in that area. The other area is that of the impact of the first language, the mother tongue, and individual differences. And we looked at some of those studies as well, but we were mostly interested in the more longitudinal studies where students had been, they were, they were subjects of research either at home, within a home context, when they had um, an intensive course of language, or when they studied abroad. And in all cases, it was found that fluency improves over a period of time, um, over either a semester, over three months, um, or even over a longer period of time. But, and this was the question that our colleague wanted to look into particularly, can classroom instruction help improve learners over a limited period of time? The limited period of time was only four weeks, and I must say both myself and my colleague Colin were very sceptical that there would be any noticeable difference in that period of time. But we thought, well, it's all good practice for us. We're getting used to doing research, reading the literature, and let's see how it goes. The two research questions we had were, um, does awareness raising and strategy training have an impact on L2 speech fluency of learners on an intensive course? This would have been our pre-session course. <coughs> so we were going to try and raise their awareness of fluency and do some specific strategy training with them. Um, we decided we'd look both at monologues and at dialogues. And the second question we were interested in, oops, sorry about that. Um, was which aspects of fluency are more sensitive to this instruction. 
And that goes back to whether it was things like pausing or speed fluency or articulation rate. So the methodology was um, for over a four week period, we had a pre test and post test. It was a four week intervention. We did something every week um, with the experimental group and we looked at monologues and dialogues. The participants were 45 students enrolled on the pre sessional course at Reading. They were here for a period of um, two semesters or more, and this was the first semester that they were in the UK. They were all, on average, um, IELTS 5.5 in terms of their speaking level when they started the course. The design of the course, we were, um, they had 21 input hours per week. In terms of listening and speaking, they had four and a half hours per week, and all of the students were following the course um, as well as doing this extra fluency practice. So our aim was to raise learner awareness of different aspects of fluency, to teach the strategies to help them overcome, and then to give them some opportunities for in-class practice of fluency strategies as well as um, follow-up outside of the class. The activities were only 15 minutes of class time twice a week, either awareness raising or strategy instruction and one weekly homework, based, fluency based homework that we gave them to do. And an example of a kind of task that we would give them was uh, letting them listen to an L2 speaker and asking if uh, someone who wasn't very fluent, we were asking well, why was this speaker not fluent, what were the areas that they would focus on. And they picked up for example on pausing, okay, they, they kept, they had long pauses between what they were trying to say and the pauses, we asked them then where did the pauses occur they occurred in the middle of sentences as opposed to just at the end of sentences or in the middle of phrases. And they picked out another time things like repetition. So we spoke, we chose particular um, aspects of fluency which we showed, played for the students and let them focus on it. We also, um, we'd recorded the students. So with the recordings we asked them to listen to themselves and identify where they paused, was it at the middle, in the middle of phrases, at the end of phrases. <coughs> and then we followed that up with teaching them a strategy. Rather than having complete silence, we taught them some fillers that they could use to give them time and make them sound more fluent. And they got, they quite got into this actually. And they were trying it out on each other and introducing these fillers in all sorts of different situations. So this basically is the structure of, of the course. Um, they had from weeks one to five, it's a ten week term, used to be ten week term, um, they had regular classes and we would have been focusing on developing their listening and speaking skills. So the speaking element would have included um, development of uh, preparing them for participation in seminar skills, um, giving them topics to discuss, prepare and also presentation skills. We would have, as well as that, have been looking at areas of grammar. Um, developing a vocabulary, the range of vocabulary, and also working on pronunciation. Then in week five, we had the pre test monologue and dialogue, and in week 10, we had the post tests. And that, in week 10, also, we have the final exam when they have um, a speaking test as well. The tasks were mainly, they were very similar to the kind of tasks that they were already doing in class, but the topics were different. So, for example, the pre-test monologue was uh, they had one minute time to plan and then they had one minute to talk. The last time you went or did traditional shopping, tell us about the experience. In the case of one student, he had never gone traditional shopping in his life. Everything had been done online up to that date, so it was quite an interesting interview to listen to. The post-task, similar design, one minute planning and one minute talk. They had to tell us about their first day arriving in Reading. And they were tasks that the students were interested in. They were quite um, interesting stories. Um, and they were interested in listening to each other after that as well. The dialogue task that we did first for the pretest was one minute planning and three minutes talk. And they were given a role related to this topic of travelling alone or in a group, which was better. And student A was given a specific role, student B was given a specific role. We were recording the students as they did, obviously. We were recording the students when they did the monologue and when they did the dialogue. So we had quite a lot of data um, at the end of all of that. 
just an example of the, this is the pre post task watching a film at home or abroad sorry watching a film at home or in the cinema and each student had to take a role in this case again so the analysis of the data well first thing we did was we transcribed in great detail which took a lot of time including all of the things we had special symbols that we were using for the pauses and when they repeated something or when something didn't make sense um, and it was a lot easier to actually transcribe the monologues than it was the dialogues because sometimes you didn't know if something was a pause or it was an interruption um, so we looked at these areas specifically the mean length of the run the number of syllables between two pauses the mean length of the pause the number of silent pauses that happened in the middle of a clause as opposed to the end of the clause we also looked at the articulation rate which is the mean number of syllables divided by the amount of time taken to perform the task minus the pauses and then with the pauses sorry and then we looked at the time taken to perform the task without the pauses and the speech rate the number of syllables divided by the total number of time this was all done with using a program called Pratt um, and there was also a correlation analysis done and there was one run through Manova as well so the results showed that um, all students improved in terms of overall fluency which you would expect because they've got the 21 hours per week some of them might have been staying with families um, and they were also exposed to um, conversation club and various activities that were going on in the university the research question one that we had in terms of strategy and awareness did it make a difference yes <coughs> we found it did actually make a difference and our second question, which is the one we were most interested in, well, our colleague was most interested in, was which aspects of fluency um, would this make a, a, a difference in? And the three aspects were um, articulation, um, the speech rate, and the length of the run. And all of these, with the experimental group, had improved over the three-week period. The control group had relatively small gains. Um, they Interestingly enough, one of the areas that they did improve in was the use of pausing. We've no idea why that is. Um, their language was a little bit more accurate between the first week and the fourth week. And we're not sure if they were thinking a little bit more about the language that they were working on. And um, the experimental group were aware that we were trying to develop their fluency, but they didn't know that uh, the kind of analysis that we were doing in any sort of a way. And the non-experimental group were as far as they were concerned. They'd been recorded at the beginning and at the end, but they weren't aware of any experiment that was going on. So what does that mean, really? Well, there are a number of factors that could be involved. It was only over a four-week period. You have factors like the first language of the student. There was no way that we could use that um, and analyse it because we were talking about students from 12 different language backgrounds. But it would have been interesting to know if there was any correlation between and the degree of, of development that the student made in relation to their L1. The other area is personality. Um, that some learners take more time, they're more reserved naturally anyway, so the pauses, the number of syllables between pauses, maybe someone speaks slowly in the L1, it's not anything to do with fluency in the L2. Um, so what we're saying is that a lot more research needs to be done but we felt that there was enough difference um, in certain areas of fluency that made it worthwhile trying to teach more of these strategies and get the students' level of awareness raised in terms of how they actually could improve fluency. So it's something that we've started to incorporate a little bit more into our programs now. And fluency, it develops in time as it needs automation and proceduralization of rule use. We don't know whether our experiment had anything to do with that proceduralization. Did it help the students uh, develop because they were proceduralizing through the meta language that we were using to explore the whole idea of fluency? Did it help them proceduralize and optimize their language? We're not really sure. And that's all. Thank you very much.
Can I just ask whether the, the mean scores for both groups are the same sort of comparable at time one? Because if, if you have one a so high mean with the experimental group, yes. or a so high mean with the control group, they would probably show a lower rate of gain. Yes. Because of ceiling influence. So there was no significant difference between the two groups. Um, I can't go into the analysis enough, I don't, didn't understand enough about it, but that was one of the things we checked for at the beginning. And we, there were actually three groups, and there was no significant difference between the overall scores of any of the groups. There were between individuals, but not in the overall groups. So they were, they seemed to be on a, a similar level. And at a time too, did you get any sense that the students were just less anxious? Because anxiety is one of the biggest inhibitors of this. No, so. that's an interesting one actually. We No, and we didn't even consider that at all. Um, but having said that, the, the sort of style of the classes that we do are, are quite relaxed. The atmosphere is quite relaxed. So, but I take the but point. But time one, have they just they, arrived? They, they no, they've been four weeks on the course, okay, so, so this would be week five. Them. Yeah, they would have been used to the, the general activity. And the sort of activities that we were actually recording would have mirrored similar tasks um, that they've been exposed to in the previous four weeks. Thank you very much. A very interesting study. Um, I was wondering, uh, people who use English as their academic lingua franca, they're very good when it comes to talking about the content, subject matter, but they're yes. not so, they find small talk and social topics a lot more difficult to talk about. So I was wondering, I understand it's an experimental study, you had tasks yes. for them, and that's what you recorded. But I'm wondering, uh, had the stakes been higher, or the other way around, if that would have made a difference, or we, we, that could also be something to look at. Um, because uh, I've been doing work on um, students, international students, talking about content, what they're mm -hmm. studying, and, and they're fantastic at that. At uh, what level would they be? Uh, master's and PhD students. But master's students was what I looked at a few years ago. But when it comes to stopping and talking about uh, everyday issues, yes. that's when they think, oh, this is difficult, because then they don't really, they know their subject. Yes. They don't know how to talk about real life. And what language level would they be? Would they, they be higher than I am? Pretty much yours. Pretty so much they would have been okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering, just, uh, this is not a real question. Yes. But it's yeah. about when they talk about what they're studying, when they're talking about things that you ask them to talk about, in these tasks. Yes. I'm wondering if that could be something to think about. It, it could be. It could be. It would, work, it would be worth looking at that, definitely. Yes. And, and certainly some of the students would have been able to talk about their particular academic subject, and others would have, I think, struggled. Yes. But it would be worth okay. it. Yeah. Okay. It would be worth it. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, I enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if the, how the groups were selected. Uh, Basically, we had. Um, a total number of students. They were all divided. They were divided into four groups, right. and two of us had the experimental groups. And then according to their level, their language level. Sorry. Oh, so when they arrived, they were placed according to whether they were IELTS 5.5 or 4.5 or six. So were the two groups the same? Language? They were. The, yes, the th three groups were the same language level. Okay. And did did they have the same teacher? No, um, my colleague Colin and I had the experimental group, and then we had another teacher who had the other group. And who? The control group. When, when you recorded the results, who was actually recording the, the results? The was, students was had microphone. it was the teachers in the classroom. Okay, but well, I mean, when you listened to, did the, I guess the question Sorry. is, did the person who was listening to the results and recording the length of pauses and things like that, did that was that person invest, involved in the research? Um, no, they weren't, because that, what, that was taken outside and it was run through a, a software called oh, Pratt, okay. which okay. actually analysed the data. What the researchers did do was transcribe, actually just wrote it up, and then we um, had it run through the timing and all of that afterwards. But there was probably, there would have been some subjectivity in the sense that we were marking where the pauses were, for example. Right. Uh, not the actual length of them. Um, and sometimes, and, and we did do, we each looked at 20% of the other persons to try and keep it um, as consistent as possible. And there are some areas that you, you, you were going on instinct because it wasn't very clear whether it was a pause in the middle of a, of a phrase or whether the student had actually finished and moved into a, another thought process. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much.